Well, we are in an incredible passage of scripture here this morning. Um, when I was in my early 20s, the buzzword that was going around in churches was, was, was the word awesome. Everything was awesome, right? A word that is intended to mean awe-inspiring. But if everything is awesome, then really nothing is awesome. But there is no better word that captures the true essence and picture of Revelation 4 than the word awesome. It is awe-inspiring in its content, and it is awe-inspiring then uh, it is awe-inspiring in the effect that it can have on believers. I want to start this morning by taking us to the wedding of a couple that were in our church called Eden and Jonah. Now, a beautiful couple in the life of our church. Um, in a wedding, there is no greater moment than the entrance of the bride, followed closely by the reaction of the groom to the entrance of the bride. Um, in, that, uh, in the wedding of Eden and Jonah, it took Jonah just a glimpse, just a glimpse of the beauty of Eden to break into tears. It was such a beautiful moment to watch. And we actually see it at a lot of different weddings that the groom just needs a glimpse, just a glimpse of the beauty of his bride. And he is overwhelmed with reminders of her character, her goodness, her tenderness towards him, and emotions flood into the heart of the person. Um, I messaged Jonah and asked him, um, you know, why did you burst into tears like you did? And he said to me, I couldn't believe how lucky I was to be marrying my best friend. Just a glimpse is all it took. For many grooms, a glimpse of beauty is enough for them to run through a wall to devote their lives in faith and devotion to their partner. Now, Moses had a very similar experience in the book of Exodus. And we see that he leads the Israelites uh, out of Egypt. And as they come out of Egypt, um, instead of living lives worshipping the Lord, as Moses goes to spend time with the Lord, Israel turns ear back to worship of false gods. How heartbreaking that would have been for Moses, right? To see God's people lost in worship of false gods. And so Moses makes a request from the Lord. He could have asked for anything. And if we let our, our minds wander even just a little bit, um, the requests he could have made are obvious. He used to be a ruler in Egypt, so he might be asking to go back. God, just make me a ruler back in Egypt. They're already worshipping false gods. Let me just rule them in Egypt. It's going to be better for everyone. Maybe uh, he would have asked for riches. Maybe he would have just asked to um, you know, cast away the Israelites. He could have asked for a number of things. But the thing he asked for is this. He says, Lord, show me your glory. Of all the things that he needed to have his heart full of faith and devotion, Moses asked for a glimpse of the glory of God. So powerful is the beauty of the glory of God. This picture of Eden and Jonah at their wedding day is this little glimpse of what can happen when our hearts are full of um, an awareness of the beauty and the power and the mercy and the majesty of the glory of God. And our hearts do need that. And Jesus meets with his disciples and he says, in this world, in your life, you will have trouble. And so what is going to stir your heart in faith and devotion? It's going to be this picture that we have of the throne room of God in Revelation 4 is going to serve you by giving you a glimpse of the profound beauty and the glory of God. For a heart that is captured by the glory of God will be a heart overflowing in faith and devotion. And um, over the next two Sundays, uh, we're going to be studying the book uh, of Revelation in chapters 4 and 5, looking at this picture of the throne room of God. In Revelation 2 and 3, we read that God, uh, through Jesus Christ, dictated seven letters to seven churches and called them to a great many things. And one of the greatest things that he called them to over and over and over again 
was endurance. Now, what is going to propel these churches forward in endurance? It appears that Revelation 4 has the answer. It is going to be a picture of the glory of God, a heart captured by that picture. What's going to stir your faith? What's going to stir your devotion? You are going to be served well by allowing your heart and your mind to be exposed to the picture, this scene of the glory of God in Revelation um, 4. So, the throne room of God. What kind of majestic scene do we see in Revelation 4, particularly in the throne room of God? Well, we haven't got there yet. So let's get there. Let's begin at verse 1. If you've got your Bibles with you, I'd encourage you to keep them open. Uh, This is verse 1. John writes, After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, this is a reference to Jesus, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. Now, please note two timestamps here, one at the beginning of the verse and one at the end of the verse. The first uh, timestamp is from John's perspective. After this, I looked, he says. The second timestamp is from God's perspective. Jesus says, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. This is not from John's perspective. This is from God's perspective. Chapter 1, verse 19, tells us, uh, this is John writing. He says, Write therefore the things that you have seen. Jesus speaking, John writing. Write therefore the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place. The seven churches of chapters 2 and 3 fall into the category of those that are. They were seven real churches existing in seven real places, facing real challenges for their time and location. Now it seems that Jesus is taking us into future realities. He's speaking of, uh, sh- he speaks of sh- showing John what must take place after this. It is a future undisclosed time. It is a scene in the throne room of God intended to propel faith love and devotion. So now let's look down at verse 2 as John describes for us this scene. He writes, At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. Uh, Jesus has invited John to bear witness to this future scene in the throne room of God. And uh, John writes the words, Behold, a meaning be sure to look, meaning that there is something of significance that needs to be seen. Now, in this chapter alone, we see that the word throne is mentioned 11 times. It is a significant feature of the scene of uh, Revelation 4. So two questions should come to mind. Uh, Firstly, what is the significance of the throne? And then secondly, Who is the one seated on the throne? So firstly, what is the significance of the throne? The throne is a symbol of God's sovereignty, his sovereign rule. This is Psalm 103 verse 19. It says, The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. This is Isaiah 66. It says, Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. In the Old Testament, we see the throne as a symbol of God's unmatched rule. His rule is comparable to no one. His rule is incomparable to world leaders, incomparable to the influences of the world, and it is even incomparable to the way that we would seek to reign and rule over our own lives. And when I was growing up, uh, my dad would always say that when it comes to politics, we're choosing the lesser of two evils, right? He was always convinced that whoever we were picking would be a person who is undeserving of our vote and is a person that we would just have to settle into 
um, to vote, for he was the lesser of two evils. What this text begins by showing us is that when you submit your life to the reign and rule of God, you are not settling. You have not chosen the lesser of two evils. You have done the right thing in placing your worship under the sovereign rule of God, for He is the one who is most worthy. You can have confidence that when your heart um, considers the rule of God, you are not settling. You have turned your heart to the highest greatness. But that's not the only divine reality that the throne represents. It also represents the comfort of God. In Isaiah 6, Isaiah is looking for hope as his people are lost in sin. And God gives Isaiah a vision of the throne room. And it says, In the year that King Isaiah, uh, Isaiah died, I saw the Lord seating, uh, sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his roan filled the temple. Now, Isaiah might have been tempted to think that because of the presence of sin and heartache amongst God's people, that God had abdicated the throne. That was not the case. You see, when we receive this picture of God on the throne, we don't have a picture of God absent from the throne or God simply resting on the throne. No, this is a picture of God ruling on the throne. And so the encouragement for all of us is that when things seem out of control, they are not out of control. The highest one, the one worthy of all our worship is ruling and he is ruling with his sovereign hand. God has never given up on his people. God has not given up on his people. In this time and this future picture that we have received shows us that God will never give up on his people. That is to say, God has not given up on you. He has not looked down at his people and decided to get off the throne, wrap up the world in a in a, um, a piece of rubbish and throw it in the trash can. God has not done that with the world. God that has, not, has not done that with your life. God has not given up on you. And so the throne room shows us the sovereignty of God. Next, the throne room reveals the beauty of God. Uh, it says in verse 3, if you look down in your Bibles, it says, And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Who is the one that is on the throne? Well, it can't be Jesus. Why? Because the greatest gift to humanity is that the Son of God came into the world and took on flesh. You can have confidence that you will receive a bodily resurrection because Jesus was resurrected bodily. You can have confidence that your future life in heaven will not be you floating as a vapor, but you will have a renewed body because our Lord and Jesus, our King, has a renewed body. We have also in Scripture already seen two pictures of the glorified Christ. We have one on the Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus is in glowing white. And we also have one in Revelation 1 where Jesus has hair of wool and um, has the the voice that speaks the sound of um, many rushing waters. Jesus is and forever will be in bodily form. And so this picture that we have of one on the throne um, is not a person who is in bodily form. It can't be Jesus. So the one who sits on the throne also can't be the Holy Spirit. No, the one who sits on the throne is the one to whom Jesus prayed to. In verse 5, we see that the Holy Spirit is before the throne. It cannot be Jesus. It cannot be the Holy Spirit. It must be the one who spoke at the baptism of Jesus and said, This is my Son of whom I am well pleased. It is the same one who showed his glory to Moses. This is the one who reigns on the throne. It is Yahweh, the father of all creation. And John's description of the father is consistent with what we know about the father. In John's vision of the throne room in chapter 4, there is no body to describe. 
God the Father is without bodily form. John 4 says God is spirit. He is unique. There is no one like him. And so how do you describe someone that no one is like? Well, the best that John can offer is a description by comparison. And it is a description of profound beauty. What does it mean to describe the father as having the the appearance of jasper and carnelian? Well, jasper and carnelian are gems and they are beautiful gems. Jasper is usually red, yellow or brown in color and um, can't be seen through. Carnelian is a reddish brown stone that can be seen through. And John says around the throne was a rainbow of the appearance of emerald. This is a beautiful, beautiful scene. We'll often have friends who will describe something for us. And then when we see it for ourselves, we criticize their description. Um, When our our eldest son, Jack, was going to kindergarten for the first time, um, my wife organized it all. Um, She worked it out with the kindergarten, filled out all the forms, and then described to me where to take him for his first day of kindy. And so we rocked up at the kindergarten, no problem. Jack is playing with a bunch of kids and playing lots of games. And I go and see the staff, and they can't find his paperwork anywhere. Now, why is that? It's because we were at the wrong kindergarten. My wife had given me a description of where to go that in my mind wasn't an accurate description, though I'm sure she gave me all the right details, right? But I had a criticism of her description. She had a criticism of my description. Now, I am confident that when we get to heaven and we're in the throne room of God, we won't have criticism for John's description of the throne room. We'll have sympathy. For it is a picture of profound beauty that John is chasing words to describe the beauty that he can see. Friends, the beauty of God is beyond description. It's incomparable. And so how does the divine reality of incomparable, indescribable beauty of God build faith in devotion in us and build faith and devotion in the seven churches of chapters two and three? Well, the readers of the letter and you and I are being called not to put our hope in lesser things than the most beautiful one. Friends, we are being called to remind our hearts and our minds to not put our great hope and trust in lesser things. Not our careers, not our relationships, not the kingdom that we are building for ourselves, but through a picture of God as the great and most beautiful one, our hearts would be inclined to worship and devotion towards Him above all other things. The number one rule for every uh, woman who attends every wedding is not to upstage the bride. Her gown is to be the most impressive. She is to be the center of attention. She is supposed to be the one who shines the brightest so that she is the one who is celebrated the most in the groom's eyes and the groom's eyes are always fixed on her. Friends, the beauty of God needs no one to dress themselves down. For nothing and no one can detract from His glory. His glory shines the brightest among all the jewels. His glory shines the brightest amongst everything that you can devote your life to. So why settle for a life handed over to lesser things? Why live for a life apart from the beauty of God? Why live for the approval of others that are incomparable to the beauty of God? Especially when the beautiful God is calling you to belong to Him, to rest in Him, to be known by Him. This is a beautiful thing. In the throne room of God, we see that the beauty of God is incomparable. We also see the sovereignty of God. Next, our window into the throne room of God, it reveals the mercy of God. The mercy of God. The mercy of God shows us the extent of God's love for those He saves. 
Look down at verse 4. Um, John writes, uh, Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the throne were 24 elders, clothed in white garments, with golden crowns on their heads. Now, John doesn't tell us who these elders are, who they represent. And when John isn't specific on how to interpret a part of a vision, there will always be theologians who disagree. The two main views are that these are either spiritual creatures performing some kind of leadership role, or they are human representatives. I believe that they're human representatives. Let me give you three reasons why. Firstly, the promise of 2 Timothy 2.11 is that God's people will reign and rule with Christ. These elders are on thrones and just like the throne of God, it is a symbol of authority. Secondly, crowns are frequently described in the Bible as a reward for the perseverance of believers. And thirdly, throughout the book of Revelation, God's people are shown to be wearing white garments as a symbol of their righteousness before Christ. So for those three reasons, I take it to be that those who are seated on the throne are human representatives. Now, some people reject that view. They'll do it for two, mainly two reasons. Firstly, that in Revelation 9 and 12, those working on behalf of Satan wear crowns. And secondly, angels wear white garments. So a white garment is not reserved just for the redeemed. Now, these are true facts, but in Jesus' letter to the churches that he has just written and and given out through John, he has promised them that the redeemed would be marked by wearing white robes, and those who persevere would wear the crown of life. It seems very odd to me that Jesus would promise persevering saints white robes and a victory crown, and then John would immediately receive the future vision in heaven of those wearing a crown and wearing white robes, and that would be any other group of people than the redeemed. In my mind, that is case closed, and we now need to consider the implications of these human representatives. And it seems to me that the greatest implication for this um, picture we have in heaven is this. God is faithful to his promise of mercy. God is faithful to his promise of mercy. Um, David Powlison uh, was a great and godly man who did a lot to promote the discipline of biblical counseling. And one father for his, 13th birthday, for his son's 13th birthday asked David to write his son a letter. And here's what he wrote. He said, I am honored that your dad invited me to write on the occasion of your 13th birthday. I just had my 56th birthday before Christmas. But one thing I've learned in all those extra years of living is that that there's not that much difference between being 13 and being 56. Of course, there's lots of particular details, but the basic and most important things remain exactly the same. What is always true becomes deeper and richer and more necessary and more joyous as your life continues to unfold. Now listen to this. He says, firstly, don't ever forget, God is merciful to you. Mercy is who he is. He writes, the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Mercy is what he does. If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for all things, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Then he writes, mercy is what you need. Lord, hear my voice. If you, Lord, should mark my iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. Don't ever forget, he writes, God himself will never forget to be merciful. For mercy is who he is. Mercy is what he does. And mercy is what you need. The elders in Revelation 4 are confirmation of God's character towards his people. God has done the great work of redeeming God's people to his very throne room. 
And if God can do the greater thing of saving us, then surely He is able to do the lesser thing of making His mercy available every day. Do you recognize your need for the mercy of God, but doubt its availability? It's available. How can we, how can we be sure? Because mercy is who He is. It's what He does. And this future picture of the throne room of God is flooded with testimony of the mercy of our God. So we've seen in this throne room a picture of the sovereignty of God, the mercy of God, the beauty of God. Next, we see that the throne room of God um, shows us the power of God. Look down at your Bibles at verse 5. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. What John shows us here is more of the beauty of the throne room of God with the addition of both the Holy Spirit, represented by the seven spirits, the number of completion and perfection, and the presence of lightning and thunder. In chapters 6 through 19, you will see that as God pours out his judgment, what often follows is a report of thunder and peals, but peals of thunder and lightning. Here John is showing us that these judgments come from the throne. John is witnessing a glimpse of God's power, which will be on full display in his judgments. God is the God of great power. Now, our house is um, in the suburbs and it's kind of at the top of this little hill. And so when there's uh, thunder and lightning going on, my family love to turn off all the lights in the house and we'll sit on the kitchen table and kind of look out and we can kind of we can see the lightning and thunder come. And um, I think we all love the lightning and thunder show. Whenever lightning's on, we love to see it and we're always impressed by it. And then every once in a while, what will happen is that the lightning will come a little bit too close and the thunder will roar. And we'll be reminded of the power of the lightning and a reverence for its power will come over us. It is true that God is merciful and beauty and beautiful. And that is all the reasons that we need to run to him. But God is more than just merciful and beautiful. He is powerful. He is to be revered. In the Bible, we are called to fear the Lord. Now, there are times that my children fear me. Um, might be that they're um, uh, doing something they shouldn't. And so uh, I use my power to correct their behavior. And so there is a kind of healthy fear that my children have of me, particularly when they've strayed from the rules of the house. But I would also say to you that there is times where my children are so, so thankful that their dad is a powerful one. And so I think of the time when my kids were at the front of my house and the next door neighbor's dog got out and started running towards my kids. They were thankful that their dad was powerful. Think of times where my kid got himself stuck in the bin and outside and couldn't get out. My kid was thankful that his dad was powerful. I understand that for some of us, the power and the strength of God is not the characteristic of God that we find most comforting. But please note this. In the book of Revelation, we are going to see a demonstration of the power of Satan. And we are going to be so grateful that our God is the most powerful one. The one who's power over satan is incomparable that the bible says that satan is like a prowling lion looking for someone to devour so what we need is a more powerful one to protect god's people from that lion and we have that powerful one whose power is incomparable this is what happens when my children are in my presence And their weakness has led to 
some kind of fear. Their fear grows into confidence. Why? Because they have access to their dad. The power of God is on display in the Revelation 4 in the throne room of God to give you confidence that you have access to this power that is in heaven. Through our prayers and through calling upon the Lord, we have access to this power. Um, This promised plan of redemption for the world, we can have confidence that it will come about because our God is the most powerful one. Friends, do not miss out on resting in the promises of God, for God is mighty and powerful to save. Friends, don't miss out on calling upon the Lord, because His power can be a resource for you in your life. Don't miss out on drawing upon His strength. Don't miss out. Don't make the mistake of revering anything or anyone greater than you revere He who is enthroned in lightning and thunder. So we've seen this morning that the throne room of God reveals to us the sovereignty, the beauty, and the mercy, and the power of God. Lastly, we're going to see the worthiness of God. The worthiness of God. The worthiness of God that shows us that God is worthy of our worship and the kind of worship that He is worthy of. So look down about halfway through verse 6. And this is what John writes. He says, And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around. So let's pause there. And this is where the book of Revelation um, becomes too much for people. Um, It's too extraordinary, too wild, too outside of the box. Friend, the whole Christian story is extraordinary and wild and outside of the box. If you've made it to Revelation, you'll be just fine. The Christian story is a story of a God who exists outside of time and space, who spoke the world into existence, who in three different eras in biblical history broke the boundaries of physical reality to produce miracle after miracle after miracle to demonstrate that even the physical world bends to his will. It is true that Revelation 4 is a wild scene, But expecting to bear witness to the extraordinary is a completely consistent way to approach the Bible. So, notice that John says that these creatures that he sees are like an ox, like a lion, like an eagle. They are something altogether different. In Isaiah 6, we have the description of angels that appears to almost exactly match the description here. It seems that these angels are called to reflect the glory of God. James Hamilton Jr. says this, Something about God is captured by the likeness of these four living creatures. God is noble and royal and fast like a lion. He has a a massive, patient and slow serving strength like like an ox. God has a sensitivity and spirituality that we can see in the face of a human being. And he has a soaring transcendence like an eagle in flight. Others have said that these creatures represent the creatures of the world, the wild ones, the domestic ones, the flying ones and humanity. All reasonable conclusions. But this is the greater point shared among all people that seeking to interpret this part of scripture. It's that though the creatures are most likely angels representing God's glory, It is their response to the glory of God that is unquestionable and given to the reader as an example to follow. Look down at verse 8. It says, And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. 
And whenever the living creatures give glory and honour and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever. They cast their crowns before the throne. The elders um, take the crowns that Christ has won for them and then throw them at his feet. Why? Because it is God who deserves all the credit for the crown. So these elders proclaim, Worthy are you, Lord. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. What does the throne room of God show us? It shows us that everything that we have, we owe to Him. Let's not kid ourselves. A life of devotion to our God is a big ask, and He is worthy of it. For our greatest treasure we did not earn. It was purchased for us at Calvary. Now, here is the difference between an illustration about Eden and Jonah's wedding and one about the throne room of God. Jonah won't like to admit this, but he deserves Eden. Eden is a prize. She is lovely and wonderful. But as lovely and wonderful as Eden is, Jonah is tender and kind. They deserve each other. But John didn't deserve to see the throne room of God, yet God showed it to him anyway. The elders didn't deserve to be around the throne room, yet God placed them there anyway. You and I don't deserve to bear witness to a throne revealing the sovereignty and beauty and mercy and power and worthiness of God. Yet God in his kindness, he's done it anyway. So how will you respond? For there is only one response that our God calls for. A people whose lives declare, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Worthy are you, Lord, to receive glory and honour and power. So let your life be marked by this. Let your life be a living testimony of the worthiness of God for profound and beautiful worship.